Hi, I'm Sam Zagami, the current cluster manager at ANSBIG. On today's episode, we will be discussing the role of life cycle assessments for biochar projects and the role that they play in technology rollout and scaling. In today's podcast, we will discuss the various components of life cycle assessment, including the keys to open carbon markets. And to help us discuss the topic, we have Philip Link, who is the Managing Director of Energy Link Services. Phil has 15 years experience in the carbon and sustainability sectors. Welcome, Philip. Thank you. Um, just to start off, Philip, would you mind just telling us a bit about yourself and what it is that you do? Sure. So as you mentioned, I'm the managing director of, uh, of a consultancy uh, called Energy Link Services, and I've been um, powering my way through the, the carbon and sustainability space uh, for the last 15 years or so and, and riding the wave of um, of government policy um, and, and private sector uh, demand for, for carbon sustainability, energy efficiency and renewable energy services. Um, the business that, that, that I've formed and it's um, we, we're sort of three and a half years old now uh, is, is really focused on, on three key pillars. And, and one is a, a set up as a traditional advisory uh, business where we, where we provide uh, services uh, in the market um, namely around things like taking businesses carbon neutral under the Australian government's climate active program. Uh, we help businesses uh, identify and cost energy efficiency and renewable energy opportunities. We help um, to facilitate and understand what opportunities exist in, in participation in carbon markets. So, so things like through um, fuel switching, um, which directly correlates to the discussion today uh, around biochar um, in that, in that um, sector, that industrial decarbonisation sector. The other aspect, and also will be a discussion uh, today, I'm sure, that we'll cover is, is that we provide audit and assurance services for the full suite of uh, carbon and, and energy efficiency certificate um, schemes and programs that exist, not just here, but, but globally. And uh, I'm sure a focus again of today's conversation will be about Pura.Earth and the role that that's playing with the uh, the evolvement, I think, or, or the, the development, I should say, of the, um, the biochar methodology. And then, a, and then a third component is actually helping clients right through the journey. Um, and that's um, really identifying costing and then facilitating the implementation of, of energy projects generally. And that could be things like facilitating uh, the, the implementation uh, and uh, an installation of a pyrolysis uh, machine in the case of, of biochar and um, utilizing those waste heat and gases for um, grid displacement, um, producing heat and steam uh, for things like agricultural fence post um, and, and things of that nature. So it's a it's a pretty big remit, but it's all interrelated and 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 really enjoyable. And I think just just sort of before moving into some of the formal questions, Sam, I, I mean, some quick observations is is that we're seeing a very strong um, uh, rise now in, in, in corporate demand, investor demand in, in the transition to a, to a low carbon future. Uh, there's, a, there's a really, really strong appetite for that. And, and that's, that's a reason due to, um, uh, you know, some would say a, a lack of government clarity and, and policy with regards to uh, how that transition is going to take place. So the private sector has just taken matters into their own hands. And, and hence, we've seen uh, voluntary carbon market schemes like Pure.Earth emerge to to provide and facilitate that transition to take place. Great, and and just kind of touching on Pure Earth, you've recently had something big to announce with regards to your involvement with Pure Earth. I just wonder if you could just tell our audience kind of how you've, yeah, what that connection is like now. Sure, yeah, so, so we um, were approached by Pure Earth um, probably 12 to 18 months ago, more like 18 months ago now, um, to assist with the verification and validation process. So, you know, taking a step back a little bit, every good carbon scheme, be it either in the compliance or voluntary space, uh, with Puro being a voluntary carbon marketplace, um, requires uh, independent validation. I think without that, uh, investors, buyers, and also creators of the, 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 the certificates, um, uh, you know, might have the confidence that that what's being claimed as as, as carbon reductions um, or carbon removals in the case of period of Earth uh, have actually taken place. So 
given our vast experience providing those type of assurance services, we were approached by Pure Earth, and, and look, mind you, they're based in Finland. Um, so it was a um, it was a case a of coup. Some, sorry, a big coup as well. I it was a big, to be recognised. It, it was, but it, you know, it's funny how small the world is. It was someone recommending us through someone else, and and you know, um, we're we're on one side of the world and they're on the other. But it just so happens that that they'd identified, and in fact, um, the reason why we were brought on board is because the first Pure of the Earth project um, had commenced creating corks or CO two reduction certificates um, in South Australia. So um, we were asked to to provide assurance and auditing services um, with regards to that project. But since that time, our relationship with Pure has evolved significantly, and we've been involved in in not just continuing to provide um, uh, auditing and assurance services over the issuance of corks, um, but also looking at um, the makeup of the facilities which generate the corks. So there's two audits that take place. Sometimes they're undertaken simultaneously. You have an output audit and a facility audit. So we've we've looked in the in the case of the facility audit, we've we've had to look at the, I guess more around the engineering, the nuts and bolts of how the how the units operate, um, how they're capturing and utilizing waste, heat, and gases. Uh, how the, the char itself is being measured and weighed, the feedstock um, from where the, 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 the char is being produced. So, you know, um, that, that's, a, that's quite an evolved process. Um, we've learned a lot from that. And, and I guess from those learnings and as Pura.Earth as well is, has started to emerge as, as, a, a, and really gather momentum itself, um, uh, we've been providing regular updates and input into their overall process not just on the audit and assurance side but generally how the the method operates so it's been a really fun ride and it's taken us to um, projects not just in Australia but also in Europe and uh, and and particularly the United States where there's quite a lot of cork cork biochar specifically um, projects that are generating corks from 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 biochar uh, are taking place so um, and all of that uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depends on how you look at it, has all been done remotely. So we've had to think really on our feet too. And, and how do you um, how do you provide robust validation uh, services um, uh, in, in, the, in the COVID environment? Yeah, well, I mean, like, congratulations on, I suppose, having that, um, that connection with Pure.Earth. I mean, it's, that's great. Um, I suppose I'll just kind of straight away go back into our questioning um within energy link services um you know providing a ride a wide range of emission auditing for companies to ensure that they are heading towards net zero in the clean tech sector i.e doing their best to reduce and avoid emissions mm -hmm. can you just explain what it is your company does in the carbon management space specifically in relation to biochar I mean I don't know if you kind of touched on that a little bit before yeah I have I have but I'm happy to, to delve in a little bit and I think maybe yeah. the, a good place to start would be to actually talk about the different um, forms of, of, of carbon offsets which are are emerging or have been in existence um, and and how does puro.earth differ with the biochar method so I mentioned to you that we do quite a lot of work in um, energy efficiency, for example. Now, energy efficiency uh, and capturing uh, and quantifying the um, uh, the benefits of of let's say switching out lights or replacing a motor or a drive or an air compressor. Um, there are mechanisms to account for the carbon and energy savings associated with those type of projects. I mean, it's a simple, you know, what did you use before when you installed the project? How did how did um, energy use come down? And that delta is, is what you can create a, a carbon credit or an energy efficiency certificate around. And now those types of certificates are, are, are generally seen as avoidance. So you're avoiding emissions, right? Because you're not using as much energy in the case of energy efficiency, um, because you're doing the same thing with, with, less, with less energy required. Now, another um, area that carbon credits or another segment of the, that, that carbon market is, is what we call carbon removals. And this is where Pura.Earth um, uh, you know, differ themselves from other voluntary carbon market schemes, where they focus completely on projects which um, uh, fall into that carbon removal category. And in addition to that, 
they're focused around this, this idea of net negativity. So really the, the Pura credits um, and the carbon removal, I should, before I, I say that, is, is essentially something that, that um, removes carbon from the atmosphere uh, and stores it. Uh, and as we know, as, as, as biochar uh, specialists or experts, uh, I wouldn't call myself a biochar expert, but I'm sure many in the audience are and our um, fellow members within ANSBIG are, uh, you know, the literature and, and there's lots of it, um, state and really focus on um, the fact that, that, um, that biochar is a, is a permanent store, so 500 plus years of carbon. So that's, that's where they've, you know, hung the hat on, so to speak. This is pure to earth. And it's really a, a great differentiator. And as a result of that, um, Pure Dot Earth have managed to, um, well, if, if anyone is interested, you can, you can see where those carbon credits, those corks they're trading at, and they're, 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 they're trading at a significant premium to um, projects which fall into the avoidance category or for that matter, other types of removals because of the, uh, I guess, the, the specific requirements of the Pure methodology. Um, that are built in, 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 in the case of biochar. And I must say there are other methodologies that, that Pure Earth have, um, uh, uh, you know, as part of their suite of, of carbon reduction or carbon removal methodologies. Um, and so we, in the, in, specifically in the case of the biochar, you know, they, they're, they're trading at premiums because of, uh, of that, that notion of net negativity of permanent removal uh, from, from, from the atmosphere. And then playing and it playing a role in that in that transition because I think uh, if I'm really honest and 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 the reading that I do around around climate change and how we're tracking towards uh, I mean even our 1.5 or two degrees goals around around Paris uh, you know we're we're beyond just needing to focus on emissions avoidance we need to start really concentrating on removals um, and you know there'll be engineered forms of removals, you know, carbon capture and storage is a, is a bit of a flavor of the month, particularly with the Australian government and, and the, the investment that they're making um, with regards to that. Uh, but I like to sort of think, and, and maybe I might get a bit of criticism around this, but um, I, for me, biochar uh, and the role that biochar and pyrolysis plays is, is, is nature's carbon capture and storage. It's got, you know, a suite of additional benefits. And I think that it's, um, it's significantly undervalued. So I'm really, really pleased to be um, you know, joining the group and, and playing a role in the, um, not just in the validation, but in other, other aspects to, um, to showcase the benefits of biochar in, in carbon markets and what it can do for industrial decarbonisation in particular. Mm. And you kind of mentioned, um, touched on it a little bit, but I just wonder, biochar projects specifically, um, you know, what do you feel are the key features that would be, they would that would be considered a climate positive? Yeah, uh, that's, I mean, that's a great question. And I think um, I'll sort of break it down into what would it be three or four main areas. The first one is the, the feedstock. So where is it coming from? Um, ideally, and in the case of Puro, it should, it should be coming from a waste source. Uh, in the case of the Rainbow Bead, a project that we provided auditing uh, and assurance services around, I mean, that was, that was using um, commercial industrial timber waste from um, the Melbourne region, which was which was travelling away. So, um, you know, utilising a feedstock that that is considered a waste um, is is the first protocol. So you're not you're not felling virgin forest, for example, to feed a to feed a unit. Um, the second is capturing uh, and utilising the waste heat and gases that come off the unit. So rather than those being emitted. Um, you're actually utilizing uh, for utilizing those waste that waste heat and gas uh, that syn gas for the purposes of let's say powering a boiler which produces steam for an industrial process. So in effect, what you're doing there is um, uh, is also displacing potentially a fossil fuel um, in in that process. So if the if the boiler previously um, was powered by grid electricity or diesel, or even in some instances, believe it or not, we still have coal-fired boilers um, in Australia. Um, you're by using that, um, I, you know, we would call it a very clean um, gas, the syn gas that's coming off the pyrolysis units to power that that boiler. Um, you, you know, you are you are in effect utilizing 
uh, an additional waste heat and gas source. Um, the third one is, you know, what is the, the char used for? Um, and that's, 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 funda that's a fundamental component too. Um, the first thing is, you know, operating within the spirit of the scheme and, and with, within what we're trying to achieve here, you can't burn it. Um, so fundamentally, the char needs to be put to good use. And probably, again, um, to the horror of anyone here that, you know, they probably would, uh, you know, um, beautiful black biochar, um, no one would want to see it being burnt because it has such a high value. I mean, look, in Australia, it's a bit of a chicken and egg at the moment. Um, everyone recognises the value of char, but there isn't yet the, the you know, the, the volume that, you know, serious players can move into. So we're still in a, in a state of maturity in the biochar space, but um, I'm sure that, you know, as this, this uh, uh, you know, corks and, and as the market matures, there'll be a lot more supply around. And this, that supply could be used for things like composting, uh, for water filtration. I mean, I don't sort of need to talk too much about the use cases, but, um, you know, just so it isn't burnt because we don't want that stored carbon to be released back into the, into the atmosphere. So they're the three key areas. Great. Thank you. And, you know, in, in terms of, I think maybe Pure Earth has actually been quite useful for the biochar sector because it's now, it's helped almost put biochar on the map more widely known. Um, so it's really great. And I suppose, you know, that kind of leads into my next question of, you know, why you think Puro.Earth's biochar methodology is so effective? Um, you know, what makes it so effective? And is it just for producers of biochar? Yeah. yeah. So again, it's another, it's another really good question. Uh, I mean, I think, I think it comes down again to a, to a couple of things. I mean, the first, the first thing will be it's it, the fact that it's a carbon removal. And as I said, on the demand side, um, corporates are very much seeking high quality, high integrity um, uh, carbon offsets uh, and, you know, in order to, to, to reach their ambitions. And I think it's, um, it's a pretty well known fact that the, the project in Australia that, that generated the first batch of corks was snapped up by Microsoft. Uh, mm -hmm. Microsoft released the global uh, request for for, for uh, quotation, I think was the, the, the term that they used and, and sought projects from around the world to meet, to meet their um, carbon reduction ambitions. Again, Microsoft is trying to do as much as they can under the bonnet, so to speak, you know, with through energy efficiency and, and offsetting, um, you know, grid-based electricity with renewable energy and the like, but they still have residual emissions that need to be uh, offset, in, you know, in order to meet their net zero and, and, and carbon neutrality ambitions. I think actually from memory, uh, uh, Microsoft are one of the, the few firms which have determined that uh, they actually would like to offset emissions from company inception. Um, so that's, that's really interesting because, you know, you're not actually, they can't go back in time and change their processes, obviously, or how their, how their emissions looked, you know, in the in the 70s or 80s, but they can offset those. And so that their procurement strategy is very much, and, and you know, Microsoft is one company. There are, there are numerous others that um, have very specific requirements, offsetting requirements, which lend themselves to that notion of net negativity and, and, and removals. So Puro plays a very strong role in that. And I think that that's reflected in the price. Um, the other thing I would say that it does um, lend itself to is um, the ability to support, um, it's probably the wrong word to use, but because we are in a, in biochar is an emerging uh, industry, we're not at full production scale, if you like. So we're not talking about, you know, massive plants that produce hundreds and thousands of tons of char per year, per annum. Uh, and as a result of that, um, it, it is, it is a methodology that can be applied to your, you know, not yet commercial, you know, small industrial use case, because it's it's a it's it's straightforward, it's pragmatic, it is robust. Um, you know, once you've once you've found a project uh, or a use case rather uh, for for the unit, and you meet the the key criteria that I outlined before, um, you know, you are able to. Um, relatively quickly um, start to generate certificates, 
which presents a revenue stream which can help to finance an expansion of a unit, which can help to, um, uh, you know, present opportunities for the next um, plant, um, can help to um, educate the market for why biochar is good for soil conditioning, for water filtration, for whatever else. So it, it has provided an additional revenue stream um, to, uh, to, to provide, uh, well, to expand the market fundamentally, to mature the market, really, I think it's probably the word. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we really need to mature the biochar mar market and have um, more people using biochar. So then that way, production can actually increase uh, around Australia. Um, you talked about the, the credits, and I'm just wondering, you know, you mentioned Microsoft buying them, but where else are you finding that people are buying these corks and, and why? Mm. Um, so uh, actually, it, it might be interesting to kind of note, and this is, again, public information. Recently, Bureau uh, received some investment from um, NASDAQ, so the, uh, the technology stock exchange out of the US. So I think that investment by, by NASDAQ actually sort of shows uh, or reveals where the demand source for certificates is going to come from. It's tech companies. It's tech companies around the world. Um, you know, the, the, the NASDAQ uh, is, is, a, is a very well-known stock market indice um, and, um, and in itself is, a, uh, is an exchange. So, it, it, you know, their book, if you like, will be uh, an emerging and, a, and an ongoing demand source for cork. So if NASDAQ listed companies don't get you excited for why you should create corks, I don't know what will. Um, I think what's what's going to be really interesting, um, and this lends itself nicely to um, you know climate change negotiations, which are taking place at in, in Glasgow later this year. In fact, next end of next month, will be the role of the voluntary carbon market in uh, in the world in the globe's ambitions to um, to reaching the 1.52 degree goals that were set in Paris. So um, I think that. Um, We'll, we need to be watching that space very closely because, uh, I mean, in my opinion, the voluntary carbon markets are, are, are really important to being able to unlock uh, that abatement that takes place within them. Uh, and corporates, you know, if I, if I sort of take my Puro hat off for the time being and think about my um, corporate advisory services that I provide here in Australia, we, I mean, we are working... Um, you know, on a on a on a daily basis now, taking businesses carbon neutral, um, and with achieving carbon neutrality, again, you're going to have residual emissions that you need to offset. Um, there needs to be a good supply of of robust, um, you know, well created, uh, um, um, you know, integral or, or you know, or high integrity carbon offsets to suffice that um, that business need and want and willingness. To become carbon neutral, uh, and and supplementing that through through you know renewable energy and energy efficiency projects. So there's there's a lot of demand for those certificates um, because of their because of their characteristics, but also the macroeconomic factors that are that are emerging with regards to our transition and corporates' appetite to go carbon neutral and to achieve net zero ambitions and targets. Mm, wonderful and. How do you see the role of verified climate positive biochar projects that have undergone your auditing process assisting the scaling up of the significant carbon sink economy that is going to have an impact on human emissions? Mm. So I mentioned, I think the key thing is integrity. So mm. without that third party verification process, um, you lose a lot of integrity. And so you know, we, um, we've got well-developed uh, audit and assurance procedures and protocols, which have, um, have emerged and developed through our experience um, providing those type of services in Australia. And I would say that Australia has um, one of the best, if not the best carbon reporting mechanisms in the world, uh, the ENGA scheme, the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act. Um, and, and so that, that reporting scheme has, has really um, helped us to sharpen our 
skill set, our pencils, and I'm talking about the, the sector more broadly. Uh, and so we've then been able to take that experience, those skills through, um, you know, what is it? It's probably close to 15 years now that the ENGA scheme has been in existence. Um, I think it, it just has ticked over 15 years um, uh, and, and use those skills to provide uh, the same type of services into um, emerging voluntary carbon market schemes like Pura.Earth and Vera and, you know, gold standard and anything else um, because we have such a good solid base to come from. And, and it's all about providing integrity, integrity certificates. Ask any carbon project developer, ask any buyer of certificates. One of the first questions they, or the second question they, they, they usually ask is the first one being, you know, where did, where did this certificate get created or how did it get created? And the second one will be who's, who's verified it. Mm, which makes the what you're doing at the company very important for this whole rollout, really. Integrity. Yeah. It's all about yeah. integrity. That's it. Um, and I suppose finally, Philip, the, the theme of our conference this year is biochar in the carbon drawdown decade. We've kind of, I know you've alluded to a lot of things, but I suppose any final thoughts on how biochar and the assistive technology can help us achieve more carbon drawdown? Yeah, well, look, I, um, I, I think that this is a watch this space. I think biochar's time has come. Um, well, actually, just as a, as a quick um, uh, thought or, or, or flashback, actually, to my very early career um, working, uh, this was my first job out of university. Uh, I studied at, at ANU. Um, I worked for the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, or DAF, uh, as it was called. Um, and I was in the forestry division and someone, this is probably either 2005, 2006, I can't quite recall, 2006. And um, someone sent a bag of biochar to, the, to, to our forestry team uh, as, a, as a way. So this is, you know, so many years ago. And, um, you know, we were, we were kind of joking about it. Obviously, you know, could see that there was um, a lot of merit in it, but we were sort of saying, oh, do we use this supplement with our coffee and, and things like that? But, you know, I guess that, that why I'm saying that is because, you know, that happened then. Um, the markets had all this time to mature. Uh, it seems to me now that that maturity is really now starting to kick off. It still is a, a, an immature sector, but it's really starting to kick off with, um, far more sophisticated investors paying attention to the space, the ability and the role of, of carbon credits to um, facilitate, verify and validate the removals and the drawdowns as, as, as you've called it. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, being able to quantify that and, and, and measure because it's all about, you know, tied with sophisticated investment is um, accountability and measurability. And so the, I think that the role, the carbon markets are playing a role in, in providing that level of sophistication to the, um, to the biochar market. And the third one is its use case. So I, I think we're still, it's still evolving significantly where biochar can be used, how it can be used, but more and more people are starting to pay attention to it. Uh, there are, you know, in the conversations that I'm having um, more broadly, you know, the, the, the wine industry can't get enough biochar. You know, they are, they're a significant source now of, of the char and want more and more of it because they see what it's doing to the soils, to water retention, um, to, the, to the crops, to the, you know, their volumes, um, their yields and so forth. Uh, and, and that's just one sector that I've, that I've recently had some interaction with. I can imagine that there are, there are many more, you know, agricultural sectors out there that would significantly benefit from the char. So, you know, those three factors combined um, you know, can only mean one thing, and it's sort of the, the hockey stick um, growth path. So we're really, really happy to be part of Anne's big. Um, we, we love the work that you're doing, Sam and, and Don, um, and, and really uh, very thankful for the, for the efforts that you have put in all those years prior to where we are now. Um, and we welcome more involvement from, from industry professionals. We welcome, uh, you know, many more sophisticated investors, sophisticated players to enter the space so that that we can come up to a level and, you know, if, if we're serious about this climate challenge and this climate problem, um, you know, I think biochar is, has a significant role to play and will play into the future.
Wonderful. And thank you for, you know, for your comments today. Thank you for sharing um, and for all the work that you're that you're doing to, to help in, in this movement as well. And so what's the best way for, for people to get in contact with you, Philip? Uh, well, they can uh, they can reach me through through the ANSBIG. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure our contact details are there on the website. Um, I often on, on LinkedIn uh, at Philip Link uh, with one L. Um, my email address is philip with one L at energylinkservices.com.au. So more than happy to talk to anyone, um, reach out, continue the conversation and looking forward to the conference as well. Yes, absolutely. We're looking forward to it. So thank you very much, Philip. And thank you to all of our listeners for joining us today. If you found this episode valuable, please rate and review our podcast. And to get notified about all of our latest episodes, join Anne's Big's newsletter mailing list by visiting www.ansbig.org. And we'll see you at the next podcast. Thank you.